In spite of these problems, Mitchell and Kenyon's sports films lay down a formula which is followed to this day. They film the player's entrance, the kickoff, the halftime entertainment, and the mascots. They even capture some of the roughness. Films of over 100 games of football and rugby were found in those rusty basement canisters, including up-and-coming football clubs like Newcastle United, Bradford City and Preston North End. We managed to track down a Preston North Ender, George Harrison, who has a special interest in this film. You've all romped and coming out. On their own. Unusually, usually both teams come out together. They do nowadays. Here we come, Preston. My granddad. Leading, leading him out. But so it's a funny feeling to see a young granddad. <laughs> yeah. well, quite chuffed about that. I feel quite proud that he was my granddad. And you know, reach what he did doing football. I mean, he, he reached international status, which was a tremendous thing in them days. George's grandfather, Peter McBride, is the man carrying the ball. He had been scouted from Air United as a young man, then happily settled for the rest of his life playing on Preston's Deepdale ground. Here he is playing Wolverhampton Wanderers on the 19th of November, 1904. There some lads in that team. They're probably the directors in front there, and the ball are out and they're Dicky bow ties and whatnot. One thing you don't see now in a crowd is a football match. That's cigarette smoke and drifting up from the from the ground. And obviously, we know it's not allowed nowadays to be smoking on football grounds. Then we've got all the kids jumping and down in front of the camera. Everybody waving. Number of the men that had moustaches in those days compared with now. Quite a lot, but mostly flat, flat hats. Occasionally you get bowler hats. I don't know whether they were the better class people or not, but the flat hats were working class, mill workers and factory workers. Oh. That looks like it was a penalty. The game ended in a two-all draw. For Mitchell and Kenyon, these films were hugely popular. There's always been money in sports filming. No surprise that they were soon outgrowing their shop in Blackburn. Not only were they busy making and selling their own films, they made extra money by developing and processing other people's films on the side. There was even a national film distribution network of sorts, giving them access to new markets. So in September 1901, they had to move from Mitchell's photographic shop to much bigger offices just around the corner with their own studio. They could now offer a selection of over 300 films for sale. The films covered an extraordinary range of local scenes. People rushing out of work. Displays by the local fire brigade.
agricultural shows. And this formal party in Nelson, Lancashire, which has turned out for an earth-shattering event. As Richard and Kenyon's film business was taking off, so did a new part of British life, leisure time. Sunday was, as ever, the day of rest. Here in West Park in Hull, it is a sunny Sunday in April, just after church. It is half past 12, and the congregation's gaily showing off their Sunday best. And what Sunday best it is! The women have fantastic floral arrangements on their hats, and all possible care has been lavished on the children. The rich could afford to dress up, but for poorer people, their outfits might have spent all week in the pawn shop. On Friday evening, after receiving the week's pay, they would retrieve their smart clothes for the Sunday promenade. But as time off for holidays became more common, there was more and more calling for best clothes. Easter and Christmas were already religious holiday fixtures. Here in Preston, each Easter Monday, the town's tradition, which continues to this day, was to roll hard-boiled eggs down the hill. In those days, instead of chocolate eggs, real ones were used. They were a symbol of rebirth and Christ's resurrection. But for most people, it was simply a great excuse for a party in the park. The man in the top hat throws his eggs in the air. But these girls hold tightly onto theirs. Even the baby in the pram is showing off her egg. The man who had thrown the eggs was a professional showman. He was amongst 30 or so entertainers who commissioned Mitchell and Kenyon to shoot or develop films for them. These men were a flamboyant, roguish lot. As entrepreneurial businessmen, they were trying to make money from moving pictures. Mitchell and Kenyon in their new shop could offer the showmen everything they needed. So soon the place was buzzing. One client was the owner of Pleasure Gardens in Sunnyvale, Yorkshire. Mr. Joseph Bunce commissioned Mitchell and Kenyon to make this promo film of his new amusements. Both private and public parks had sprung up in Victorian times. They were immensely popular, providing fresh air and recreation in the middle of industrial cities. Ancient religious holy days had recently been fixed as bank holidays, which gave people four free Mondays off a year. So bank holidays were the busy times. Up to 100,000 people came each year to have fun in Sunnyvale's leisure facilities. Richard and Kenyon spiced up their ad with some additional action. The man and the woman on the donkeys are actors. And here they are in another scene. In fact, she is a he. Richard and Kenyon and the showman knew what really tickled the audience ten years before Charlie Chaplin hit the silver screen. Slapstick. Slapstick. 
the bowler-hatted showman sets up a man from the crowd. He clears a sightline for the camera and calls action. And here the showman and the topper tell his assistants to create a scene. The most flamboyant and inventive showman of the lot was A.D. Thomas, seen directing a parade, then reaping the rewards. Richard and Kenham are always on the lookout for new business opportunities, and in 1901, A.D. Thomas burst into their lives, ready to strike a deal for the two to develop his films. He had aspirations far greater than most showmen, so far, in fact, that he styled himself the picture king, the master mind of the world. A.D. Thomas then decided to masquerade as one of the most famous inventors of all time, Thomas Edison, who created the phonograph, electric light, and maybe even the movie camera. A.D. Thomas dreamt up all sorts of new ways of telling stories. For instance, the first action replay. One popular film and covered the great cricketing scandal of the year. It was made here at Old Trafford and starred one of the leading cricketers of the age, Arthur Mould. He played for Lancashire and was one of the most feared bowlers in the country. We tracked down his granddaughter, Anne Neal. I mean, to think that somebody filmed this all those years ago. You felt as though you wanted to go and say, hi, grandfather. <laughs> You know, I'm your granddaughter. <laughs> Arthur Mould had an impressive career behind him. At the height of his success in 1894, he took 207 wickets for Lancashire. This day, the 11th of July, 1901, Lancashire played Somerset at Old Trafford. But it was no ordinary match. The umpire, an Australian called Jim Phillips, seen here coming off last in the Trilby, repeatedly no bald mould. Not once, but five times in one over, and 19 times in total before lunch. Phillips claimed mould was chucking the ball rather than bowling it. The crowd came close to protesting. Jim Phillips was saying that his arm wasn't upright and he was, his arm was coming round throwing. And the others were saying it was, you know, a genuine action. The crowd was so for, uh, in favour or for Arthur Molden, they couldn't see anything wrong. And I think it was really getting to them that somebody could do this to a, a, just a cricketer they respected and everything else. Nasty little man. A.D. Thomas immediately caught wind of the scandal unfolding at Old Trafford. He sent his film crew over and asked Mould and the famous batsman A.N. Hornby to reenact what had happened on the pitch. <laughs> 